Good morning. It is so nice to have you with us today as we uh, begin a new study today. We're going to be picking up where we left off uh, about six months ago when we finished up the book of Genesis. Today we're going to continue in our, our study of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, the law, as the Jews translate it uh, into English, uh, the Torah. Uh, we'll be in Exodus today, so if you got your Bible, if you turn to Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, we'll begin right there in just a few moments, but let's start first with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for your word that you've given to us, this ancient book that you've inspired writers of your people uh, to record uh, over the centuries, and Lord, even of the, throughout the millennia. And Lord, we thank you for your word that we have that can we can study, that we can learn from, and Lord, that you can teach us through uh, in how to live our lives in a way that is better pleasing to you. Lord, we ask that you would guide our hearts as we look at these timeless truths that we'll look at today to learn to live by faith. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Looking back at, at Genesis, when we ended up uh, in, in the years about 1910 B.C. to 1805 B.C. was the life of Joseph. Joseph lived in what uh, historians today call Egypt's 12th dynasty. Uh, during that dynasty, the, uh, a group of, of people, uh, seagoing people, invaded the northern coast of Egypt called Hyksos, as the name that the Egyptians gave them about 1775 B.C., and uh, they stayed there until about 1570 B.C., and uh, they controlled the Egyptian coastal areas during that time period and, uh, and gave much grief to the Egyptians. Uh, they were a, a militarily powerful people for that, during that time, and, and it was difficult for the Egyptians to try to force them back out of their land. You see on this map, the land that was occupied by the Hyksos. Let me get a laser pointer up here. Uh, this is Egypt is the green area. You see Egypt ran the populated areas ran right along the Nile River and then out into the Mediterranean Sea. This is the Egyptian Delta area right here. And this is the where the Hyksos settled. They came in, we think that they came in from the area of the Aegean Sea. They were sailors. Uh, they were very much uh, uh, people of the sea. They came in on ships and they landed on the coastlands of Egypt, and they settled there. And uh, powerful, as I, I said, militarily, they were pretty mighty, and the Egyptians could not drive them out. And they stayed there for that those long periods, over 200 years, 240 years, it was more like it, uh, there in northern Egypt. Okay. And, uh, and so... During that that time, there was when the the sons of Israel came to Egypt, and as we come into Exodus, it does, gives us a reminder of that. The sons of Israel, in verse number one of Exodus one, the sons of Israel came to Egypt with Jacob, and it gives the names of his sons: Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. And Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in number. 
Okay, that's the number that came from Canaan, okay, with Jacob. And Joseph, it tells us, was already in Egypt as, as his, his brothers had sold him into as a slave, uh, you know, when he was a very young man, maybe 13 or so. He'd been in slavery in Egypt all that time. Okay, and it turns out that that uh, in, in Genesis 50, that Joseph said that God had called caused this to work together for good for all of them, because as this famine came, then Joseph was there and he was able to take care of his family. As we come down to verses five and six, we read all the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in number, but Joseph was already in Egypt. OK, Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. And Jacob certainly died first, but then jo Joseph died and all of his brothers died also there in Egypt. OK, Jacob and his 11 sons moved to Egypt from Canaan about 430 years before the exodus from Egypt. Around 1875 B.C., they were at that time 70 people when they first came into the land. Okay, let's come down to verse seven. But the sons of Israel were plentiful. Okay, by the time we start this story in Exodus, the sons of Israel had become very plentiful and increased greatly and multiplied. And they became exceedingly mighty so that the land was literally filled with them. Okay, now just a little bit of, remembering back in Genesis chapter 12, chapter 15, and chapter 22, God had promised Abraham over 500 years before that he would make a great nation from his descendants. And through his lineage, God promised that he would also bring the Messiah to bless the entire world. Okay, in Genesis 15, 6, and verses, on in verses 13 through 21, God had also pronounced Abraham, promised, I'm sorry, God had also promised Abraham that after, after over 400 years in a foreign land, this we know now to be Egypt, he would bring this great nation back to Canaan and give that land to them. Okay, so they're getting close to that 400-year barrier. In Exodus 12, 37 and Numbers 1, 36, we see that now after 430 years, very close to the 400 that God prophesied, the nation of Israel had grown to over 600 3,000 males. That is males over 20 years of age or older. So there's probably, well, there's a lot of younger males. Okay, so these are just adult males. The adult males were 603,000. Now, this translates to a total population of somewhere around 2 million people. So yes, they had grown into a great nation. In Genesis 47, 7, it actually says that the land was filled with them. And this was the eastern delta area of the Nile Delta, which was at the time called Goshen. Okay, let's come down to verse 8. And we're told that a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now, the 12th dynasty of Egypt, under which Joseph had enjoyed his influence, was attacked by four, these foreign invaders called Hyksos around 1775 B.C. The Hyksos occupied and dominated this western Nile Delta in the coastline of Egypt and Palestine for over 200 years. Verses 9 and 10 says, we read, Look, the people of Israel, uh, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. This is what this new king says. Let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and it happen in the event of war that they 
also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. Now we know from Egyptian history that finally the Hyksos were overthrown and driven out of Egypt. And we know who that king was under, from Egyptian history. That was Amos the first. Now I've got an appendix at the end of this lesson that I'm going to give you that shows Amos the first and what is called the 18th dynasty of Egypt's pharaohs. Okay. This is uh they, they were going to be later known for their prowess, their archaeological prowess, and their great building projects and their great military might. Amos the first and his nation was understandably still very leery of foreigners, and they feared the numbers that the people of Israel had become, and they were living freely in the area of Goshen, and which is in north the east northwest i'm sorry egypt and the pharaoh also desired to continue using the israelite people as laborers for growing food crops raising their livestock which they'd been doing all these years for 200 years no problems and support also now he wanted to use them as slave labor for their building projects and he was concerned about maintaining dominance and control over them as they continued to grow in numbers. And so Pharaoh made a series of decisions and decrees which effectively enslaved the Israelites. Now, there are records of what exactly those decrees were. Okay, I'm not going to have time to go into those, but Egyptian history has a record of what those decrees were. And this was this Amos the first who did that. And he and these held them in Egypt, and this flew in the face of God's promises to Abraham to bring them back to Canaan. Okay, but you're not going to defy the living Almighty God. Okay. So look at verse 11. And they appointed taskmasters, taskmasters over the Israelites. And they began to afflict them with hard labor. And they built for Pharaoh a store, the storage cities called Python, Python and Raamses. Okay. Now, the of those two storage cities, we see in Genesis, back in Genesis 41, 37 through 45, we see that under Joseph, that Joseph had built those two those two storage depot cities to store the grain during the times of plenty and that was also the the, the depots under which he dispersed the grain also during the time of the famine okay they they weren't named at as of yet they were just called storage depots Okay, now, the biggest and best of those was the one that was in Goshen where the Israelites were. And that is the one that got named Raamses, which really literally means is the, is the Hebrew word for storage or store, place of storage, or you could call it a storage depot. Okay. And it was located in the best of the land in Egypt, which is called Goshen, which is where the is the land the Israelites were given. Okay. Now it's later it's later being renamed Raamses. Although way back in Genesis, it was called Raamses also because Moses is writing Genesis after he's written the as he's writing the entire Torah. Genesis through Deuteronomy. So he knows the name of it as he's writing the Torah. Okay. A much later, a much later Pharaoh, which is causes confusion, especially in the in the movie called The Ten Commandments, uh, the classic movie. Uh, they called the Pharaoh, they decided there's a later Pharaoh that's called Ramses also. Okay, but he has nothing to do with the name of that city. That city was named that long before he lived. 
Okay. Either he was named after the region, possibly having family claims to the region. Okay. After the Israelites were long gone. Okay. Or calling himself Pharaoh who restored the best of the land. Okay. Which is where Ramses was located. Okay. Now, this Ramses is going to come many, many, several, a couple of centuries, at least two centuries later from this time, was also a great conqueror. So, by this 240 years after Joseph that we're in the time of this story in Exodus, the people of Israel must have experienced a great crisis of faith as they are now enslaved in the land. And they didn't know how they were going to get their freedom back. They weren't a military, militaristic people. Look at verse 12. But the more the Egyptians afflicted the Israelites, the more they multiplied and the more they spread out so that the, Egypt, the Egyptians were in dread of the sons of Israel. Okay, so this, this problem for the Egyptians and their fears of the people of Israel was only getting worse. Let's look at verses 15 and 16. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom, now he's got a solution. This is not the first king. It's not almost the first. This is another one but that comes later. Okay. One of, and he speaks to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was called Shifra. And the other was named Pua. And he said, when are you helping the Hebrew women to when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them in their upon the foot birth stool if it is a son then you shall put him to death but if it, if it's a daughter then he she shall live the next pharaoh which by the way is Thutmose the first you, you'll see that in the appendix in just a few minutes the, this Thutmose the first developed this heinous scheme to reduce the numbers of Hebrew Israelites that would not even require an average Egyptian city citizen to get blood on their hands. Okay, the, this profession of midwives was to go to the Hebrew homes where a woman was in labor and in, assist in the delivery of the baby, and in a desperate measure. Pharaoh Thutmose the first ordered the death. Now, later we're going to find out this death was by drowning of all male children born to the Israelites. Okay, this is a direct conflict to God's view of every human life. A person made by God for his purpose and in his likeness. Okay. But most of third ordered this, this genocide of all male Israelite babies is in direct conflict of God's view of every human life. Okay. Every human life is made in God's own image and likeness. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Pharaoh saw Hebrew females as no threat since the female slaves could be used to produce children for the Egyptian males. If they didn't have enough, if they ran out of, if they ran out of Israeli males, then they would just give the Israeli females to Egyptian males and let them produce children through them. This denigrating view of women as sex objects follows whenever a nation goes down this sinful road of devaluation of human life in general. And uh, we can testify to that. Okay. Let's go on to verses 17 and 18. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. 
So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and let the boys live? So he's calling the midwives on the carpet about this. The, the godly moral character of the lowly Hebrew midwives won out over their fear for their own lives. They chose to follow God's commands and to risk their own lives in disobedience of the Pharaoh. God used the moral courage of these women to not only save the lives of many Hebrew boys, but their courageous acts worked as a witness to encourage others to take the same courageous stand. And Israel's going to need that later. Okay. They were set a great example for the men. Let's come down to verses 19 through 21. The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. So God was good to the midwives and the people multiplied and became very mighty because the midwives feared God. He established households for the midwives. Okay. God loved and blessed the Hebrew midwives for their faithfulness to him and the Hebrew people as a whole are blessed as God was good to them and the people multiplied and became mighty. God blessed the midwives and established households for them. He gave them great homes and families. God protected the lives of their entire families from the evil of the Egyptians, in other words. So let's move on to verse 22. Then Pharaoh commanded all his enslaved his enslaved people, saying, now this is implying that he has other enslaved people that are growing quickly too. And so he commands them all, saying, every son who is born, you are to cast into the Nile. And every daughter you are to keep alive. Now verses 1 and 2 of the next chapter. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. And she put the child in it and set it along the reeds of the 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 bank of the Nile. Note that the, the term translated basket there out of the Hebrew is the same term used for Noah's Ark, where God had saved the animals from the flood. In both arks, God preserved the human lives, which was Noah's family, which he chose to preserve. God and God alone has the privilege of determining the span of every person's life. Now, the, 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 the Hebrew man and wife that's spoken of here who are fathering this child are Amram and Jochebed. Amram being the man and Jochebed being his wife could all they could do was listen to God's direction and to step out in faith, looking for God to provide what seemed a seemed to be humanly impossible to hide this thing from Pharaoh and to keep from, from experiencing Pharaoh's wrath, wrath. So they hid the baby in this basket floating on the Nile river, which is down at the down near the Nile. It's, there are tall reeds that grow around the Nile and you hide something like that very small, very easily. The problem is, is the Nile is also full of crocodiles, okay? So somebody's got to be down there with a long stick poking the crocodiles to stay away from that basket. So you come down to verse four, and his sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. I guess. That's pretty scary. Uh Let's come down to verses 5 and 6. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile, 
with her handmaidens walking alongside the Nile, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying, and she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Okay, God responded to his people's faith, and he intervened in some great ways. God caused the baby Moses to be found possibly by the only person with the power and prestige to ignore Pharaoh Thutmose I's edict. God had prepared and softened the heart of Pharaoh's daughter, Hatshepsut, so that she would have pity on him. The appendix explains why we know her name also. Okay, and you look at that a little bit later. Verses 7 and 8, when Moses' sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Now, Moses' sister performed, this was a highly courageous act in this situation. Being a slave girl, she stepped up and initiated an unsolicited and potentially dangerous conversation with the princess of Egypt. She was responding immediately and with great courage at God's prompting. Moses' sister brought his mother into the palace to be his nurse. Jochebed, Moses' mother, then taught Moses the Hebrew language, the Hebrew culture, beliefs in the Lord, Yahweh, God, Elohim. Okay, those words, okay, and those customs. See, they didn't have the Bible yet. Everything was transferred by oral memory, okay? They they had oral traditions that they passed along and they memorized these oral traditions and they passed them from generation to generation. And so Moses learned those things because his mother went into the palace with him. That's so, it's so key to the story. Uh, it's so important. God provides in verse 10, the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, because I drew him out of the water. Now that that Moses, because I drew him out of the water, the Hebrew name she gave him is a, a Hebrew name. OK, it's it's very it's a sound alike word that sounds, that is Moses, okay, which is a Hebrew name that sounds like her, her Egyptian family name, which is the first Egyptian in the dynasty, Amos, Amos. And the Hebrew, the actual Hebrew word for Moses is Amos. Very similarly pronounced. Do you, do you see that? Okay. And so he she's making a word play here, but her word means drawn out of the water. Okay. It coming out of the water. All right. Now, it, it's, it's interesting. It, 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 it's just a fascinating to me, the, the word play there. Okay. But in any case, Pharaoh's daughter is most likely Hatshepsut, who would later herself be co-regent and set on the throne of Egypt as Pharaoh until her much younger brother, Thutmose III, was old enough to reign. This would mean that Moses was protected and privileged in Egypt in the palace until his later exile under Thutmose III. Moses lived in the palace and benefited from all the privileges of royalty. This includes the best education the world could provide at that time, as we see in Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament. 
This explains Moses' knowledge of geography and customs of the peoples of Canaan and places like Babylon, which is evidenced in the Pentateuch or the Torah later written by Moses when he was 80 to 120 years old. Moses would be specifically trained and educated by God for leadership of his nation, Israel. He needed these tools to be equipped to do these things. And God made sure he got them. This was all part of God's plan. Now come to verse 11 and 12. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that. And when he saw that there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Okay. Now, at the age of 40, we're told, Moses saw this Egyptian foreman severely beating an Israelite slave. Okay. Now, if Moses' stepmother, Hatshepsut, had still been sitting on the throne of Pharaoh of Egypt, Moses likely wouldn't even have been tried for this. But since Thutmose III had by this time acceded to the throne of Pharaoh, because that Shepsut had died. Moses was now seen as the new Pharaoh. Oh, okay. Moses was now seen by the new Pharaoh as a potential competitor for the throne. Okay. In the event of his death, if something were to happen to him, okay, then Moses could become Pharaoh. Okay. This was the reason that Moses felt pressured to cover the body and flee instead of trying to go explain what had happened. Moses realized that he had impulsively given his enemy, Thutmose the third, a good reason to have him executed. So Moses fled to the deserts of Midian. Okay. And uh, Got a map right here. I'll show you. Here, right here is Goshen. Okay, the the uh, right the capital city of of Egypt at the time is right down here at On. Okay, and then and here's Memphis. So these are the two main cities of Egypt. And this is probably where Moses was living at the time. This is probably the area where the construction was going, where Moses got in trouble. Okay. Now, if you'll notice from the capital city of On, there is a road that goes straight across the Sinai Desert over to Midian. See this? Here's Midian right here on the other side of the Sinai Peninsula. Okay, so Moses knew that and he hopped on that road and he took off as fast as his little feet could carry him over to Midian. Okay, he might have ridden on a chariot or something like that. I'd be a uh, little, little, uh, using a word play there with him, saying he's walking. He might not have been. He might have been riding on a chariot. He probably had access to such things. Okay, let's come down to verses 15 through 22. Moses fled and lived for 40 years in the wilderness of Midian as a sheep herder for a pagan Midianite priest named Ruel. Moses married Ruel's daughter, Zipporah, and Moses and Zipporah had a son named Gershom, as well as producing some other children, as we see in Exodus chapter 4. There, Moses worked as a shepherd with Midianite nomads. Okay in the Midianite desert. So we see, see right here, this area. Now, here's Midian. Has, there's a mountain range, and Midian is, is on both sides of this mountain range. There's one on the coastal side, and there's one over on the side that, next to a river. Okay. 
All right, verse 23. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. That's that most the third. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came to God because of the bondage. Moses was actually in exile in Midian for 40 years. So he was 40 when he killed the Egyptian, and now he's 80. Okay. He was by <laughs> Israel had continued to languish under the brutal Egyptian oppression oppression now for 80 years after the birth of Moses but that's two generations two biblical generations uh, now that most the third has been called by historians the Napoleon of ancient Egypt he was a great conqueror uh, militarily taking control of the entire fertile crescent trade route between Egypt and Mesopotamia uh, taking control of the mountain passes at Megiddo in Canaan and at Carchemish, which is the pat last pass before you get to the Euphrates River. And he defeated the armies of the Hittites, which were the main competition for the Egyptians at that time period. Thutmose III had died, but God and his man Moses were still alive. And Moses was then able to return to Egypt and God's plans were never thwarted, but the will of any person or nation by any person or nation. Okay. And despite the death of Pharaoh, Israel's opposition continued. And the children of Israel began to groan because of the bondage. They were, they were crying out to God, as it says in the Christian Standard Bible translation. But what made all the difference in this case was that Israel's cry came up to God, as it says in the King James, the New King James Version. The very spirit, this is important for us to know, the very spirit of God groans together with us when we cry out to God in pain. In Romans 8, 22 through 26 in the New Testament, it says that the spirit of God intercedes for us with unspoken groanings, too deep for words. What we cannot articulate, God can understand. And what we cannot do for ourselves or others, God is mighty to accomplish. Pray to God about your problems. He hears you and he answers every prayer. He says either Yes, no, or wait. Be patient with God. Wait on God. Call out to him, but wait. God will answer. Okay, so here 40 years later, God is answering. Okay, let's look at verse 24. God heard their groanings and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now let's, let's look at that a little bit. God's knowledge and memory is limitless. So the expression God remembered, which is similar to what God used with Noah, what God said about Noah, it's an idiom, meaning that it, God is at, acting in accordance with his promises. Okay. God was about to fulfill his covenant that he made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is what this means. Okay. And in his covenant with Abraham, God promised to use Abraham and his descendants, which are all these people of Israel that are now in Egypt, to bless the entire world and to make a nation too populous for humans to count. And we see that in Genesis 12, in Genesis 13, in Genesis 15, in Genesis 17 where God promised to Abraham and his sons this same blessing. The nation of Israel now was groaning to God. And throughout Scripture, God hears the prayers of his people. 
And he always answers each and every one of them. Sometimes over a long period of time, but he answers the, 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 the groanings of his people. Every answer to personal prayer in the present is linked to great promises made by God in our past. God will always take care of us. Sometimes we think that if it's not showing up in exactly the way that we had envisioned, God is not answering our prayers, and that is not true. Okay, let's come down to verse 25. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged it. Now, this verse means that God knew that the time of fulfillment of his liberation of the people of Israel from their bondage in Egypt had come. The object of the Hebrew verb here is not given. Instead, it is understood from the previous verse. God acknowledged the people of Israel because their time had come according to his eternal plan. God was now ready to act on Israel's behalf. And here it comes in chapter 3. Look at this. Verses 1 through 3. Now, this is great. I love this. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he's out. He's over. He's clear over Midian on the other side of the Sinai Peninsula, herding sheep. And he led his flock to the back of the desert. And he came to Horeb the mountain of God and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and he behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush wasn't burning up. It wasn't consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why this bush does not burn. I want to get a better look at this. Okay. <laughs> he was so, Moses sees this bush and he, and he and he goes and gets closer to it to, to find out what's going on over here. He he'd seen probably brush fires before and he he never seen a bush that didn't go up like a like a Roman candle. In verse number two, an angel, a messenger of the Lord, or from the Lord, appeared to Moses in the flames. Moses perceived that the Lord God was within the flames, either by his own intellect or by God's inspiration. As he got closer and he looked a little closer, he perceived that the Lord God, now that, that word Lord is in, all in caps, and that means to us that, that the word behind that is God's covenant name, Yahweh, that Yahweh was in the flames. And in verse 4, look at verse 4. And when the Lord, there's Lord, and when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. The Lord's purposes in the flame of his glory drew Moses toward his saving purposes. Moses was just a regular shepherd in Midian in the desert, but but his life had been uniquely prepared by God for this sovereign purpose. Moses responded immediately, here I am. God's response was immediate as well. Look what God says in verse 5. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. Now this makes us kind of take a step back. Um, we might criticize Moses for getting a little too uh, eager here. But at the moment, when God calls each one of us to faith in him, he, he first makes you or I, aware of his holiness and our separation from him caused by our sin. 
The word for holy, remember, means set apart. There's a gap between us that's caused by our sin. God is holy. We are not. Okay? And, and the Bible tells us that, that we are set apart from God in actually a couple of ways. Number one, the almighty creator, creator God is far, far above or set apart from each one of us strictly in terms of who God is and who we are as his creatures. He has made us. Okay. He is the one and only true living God in existence anywhere. Okay. The second way we are set apart from God is our personal sin sets each one of us apart from God, for he is holy. He has nothing to do with sin in any form. Not even thoughts of sin. Our proper response is humility and reverence and respect and fear toward God, who is holy. Let's come down to verse 6. Moreover, the Lord said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now he's humbled before God. Many years later, in Exodus 33, 20, God would say to Moses, when Moses asked if he could see God, God said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Further contact with God at this time by Moses meant that he it could be deadly. So Moses needed to tread very lightly and humbly. It was by the sheer grace of God that Moses was not consumed by the presence of God, as is the case of every one of us. When we first encounter the holy God, while we're still not forgiven of our sins. And on this personal level, God was telling Moses that his calling by God was also a part of God's greater plan for the redemption of all nations as expressed by Abraham, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob. God promised also to, through Israel, this nation of Israel, to someday send a Messiah who would be a Savior for all of mankind. Okay? It, it's a much bigger picture than any of us can even fathom. All right? It's not just a picture of taking care of a few thousand or a few million people. It's a picture of of saving the world. Okay, let's come down. Let's come down to verse seven. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry because of their taskmaster masters, for I know their sorrows. As each succeeding Pharaoh continued to magnify their oppression of the people of Israel. But the Hebrews began to cry out to God for deliverance. God said to Moses, I have heard and I have observed the misery, as is translated in the Christian Standard Bible. God sees our trials. God hears us when we cry out to him. God searches our heart and feels our pain. God knows our sorrow. He is able to sympathize with our weaknesses, as it says in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Go read that sometime. It's great. Verse 10, God is willing to deliver the repentant believer in him from the ultimate consequence of our sins. Purpose, permanent separation from him. Because of his love and grace toward his children. He is eager to hear us repent of our sins and to 
place our faith and our trust in him. Let's come to verse 8. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. In verses 8 and 10. Through his love and grace, God frees the repentant believer in the Lord from slavery to sin and makes him or her a child of the living God, one of God's people. God will use Moses to deliver his people from their suffering. God's deliverance using Moses as their leader included not only getting his people out of Egypt, but also bringing them to a new fruitful and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the Lord's promised land, the land that God promised to Abraham and then to Isaac and then to Jacob and then to his 12 sons, the patriarchs of Israel, the place of the Canaanites. The term emphasized God's covenant with Abraham and his commitment to giving the people a land that was both spacious and abundant. The place where God would grow the nation of Israel and the place through which he would bring his Messiah, the Savior of the world. Let's come down to verses 9 and 10. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now the cry of the children of Israel has come to me by saying that God stated his awareness of Israel's plight. In verse 10, God was also stating that now is the time. According to God's sovereign will, and that Moses was the man that God chose for this job. Moses, you're the man. God commanded Moses with an emphatic, come now, therefore, and I will send you. God said to Moses, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, God had been preparing Moses for this moment all of his life. Okay, Moses, of course, didn't realize that. We, we can look at it in, in hindsight and we can see, we can see that. But, but Moses was totally taken back by this. Look at verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now Moses' question amounts to, why me? It's almost a flat denial of his great calling by God. Now, Moses' reaction is understandable. In the same way, it would be like if, if one of us was asked to just go barge into the White House and make an exorbitant demand of the President of the United States. It ain't going to be so easy to go in there. You're going to have a tough time getting into the White House. Okay. And, and you're going to have an even tougher time to, to get him to get the President to sit still and listen to you say something to him. Okay. I don't care who's President. Okay. This, his personal doubts remind leaders that the Bible is not about great men and women of faith. But the great God of the universe, who is willing to use weak and flawed people like you and me for his purposes. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's come down to verse 12. So the Lord said, I will certainly be with you. I'll certainly be with you. I'll go with you. Okay, you're not going to go by yourself. I'm going to go with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I've sent you. When, I, when you have brought the people of Egypt 
you shall serve God on this mountain. It so happens that Moses was tending the sheep at the present time right in front of Mount Sinai. Okay, we'll come back to that. But he, he says, you're going you're gonna to have all the people of Israel standing right here at the base of this mountain, and you're going to be worshiping God right here. Okay, let this be let this be a sign to you. Okay. Now, God gave Moses three promises right here. Three promises. He gives this same thing to you and me every time he asks us to do so. God says, I will certainly be with you in doing this. Number two, God promised a sign to Moses when he had brought the people out of Egypt. A sign. I'll show you a sign that I was with you the whole way. And number three, Moses would join with the Israelites and worship God on this mountain and give God all the glory. Okay. God's purpose in settling, setting the Israelites free was not simply their freedom's sake. God was setting the people free so they might worship and serve him in this world. A biblical sign, the Hebrew word, the biblical sign, okay, that word sign. See it right there? I underlined it. The Hebrew is the Hebrew word hope. It's a reminder, a guarantee, a, a proof of God's faithfulness to his promises, something like a divine signature. The signs of the rainbow and the circumcision appear in Genesis. Okay. Moses' miracles and the Sabbath are established in Exodus as signs. Okay, the Hebrew verb rendered worship can also be translated as serve. It is related to the Hebrew noun hebed, which means servant or slave. When Israel reaches Sinai, they will no longer be Pharaoh's slaves. Instead, they will be the servants of the one true living God, commissioned agents of the king of kings. Let's come down to verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of our your fathers has sent you to me, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, Moses knew because he'd lived in he'd lived in the palace of Moses for he'd, the, he'd lived in the palace of the Pharaoh for 40 years. OK, he knew the Egyptians had many gods with many names. OK, and each was responsible for some small piece of order in this world. OK, well, which one of these gods of their fathers was the God of Israel? Okay, what was his name? Moses had grown up and been educated in the court of Pharaoh. Therefore, the, he, he, Moses could predict their skepticism, what, what they were going to ask when they asked, what is his name? In reality, Moses knew that God's name really carried God's authority. The name Yahweh was already known by the people of Israel to be God's covenant name, given to Abraham. But the full significance of his name was not fully understand, understood until a little later. The Israelites needed a God who was able to help, who was willing to help, and who could utterly defeat the combined powers of the numerous demonic gods of the Egyptians. And God said to Moses, here's his answer. What are we supposed to call you? God said, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The Hebrew word translated I am in this verse is the Hebrew phrase Yahweh or Jehovah. It is God's personal name or covenant name, the one that they had known about all these years, all the way back to Abraham. The Hebrew phrase Yahweh is the first person singular form of the Hebrew verb meaning 
I am. Okay. I am the I am or I am who I am. Okay. Is, is what God was, was saying there is it was expressing. Okay, let's come down to verse 15. Okay, let, let me, before we do that, let me just say a couple of things about God being the I am. There is no one like God. Okay, God is the creator of all things, both living and inanimate in the entire universe. God exists outside of and throughout the universe. God is also the creator of time. God, therefore, exists outside of time. He created time. Time is in his hands, if you will. God sees and controls all things all the time. Okay? There is no nothing in this universe that is anything like God. Okay? He is above all things. Okay, let's let's come down to verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me. Verse 15. Therefore God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Okay, the root word, the root of the Hebrew word, aya, is haya. Okay, so God's going to say his name in a slightly different way. Okay, it's translated to be, as I told you, this utilizes another form of the same word, Yahweh. God's personal name, because the third commandment forbids people from using God's name. Scrupulous Jews had traditionally held this name of God in such high regard as to never pronounce it audibly. And that's showing proper respect for the name. I'm not, I'm not criticizing that at all. Okay, even today, an Orthodox Jew, when reading a scripture passage containing this word, will say the word Adonai instead, which means literally Lord. This, this is why in our English translations, the Hebrew word Yahweh is translated Lord and is written in all caps. So we know what word is behind it in the Hebrew. Going, This goes all the way back to our original King James Bible, which is the first Bible we had. Well, it's not the first. I shouldn't say that. It's one of the first Bibles we had, was, but was the most highly distributed of, of those first Bibles translated into English. That happened in 1611. Okay. So let's come down to chapter four. And, uh, and let's... Uh, so, so now... God has explained his name to Moses. <laughs> and then Moses answered and said, in verse 1, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. Okay, now that, that sounds like maybe, see, that the Lord there is Yahweh. That's God's personal name. So that sounds like it. Maybe that's the people of Israel. They're maybe saying, well, he never, God never appeared to you. Okay. Well, God, let's see what God has to say to that. Okay. What God did say, okay, I don't have all those written down because there's nine verses here where God gives nine verses explaining various miracles and convincing signs and proofs that Moses is going to be able to show the people. Okay, and show Pharaoh, okay, a whole list of things that he's going to get, miraculous things that he's going to give Moses to be able to do to prove the, that he has seen God. And God has given him these capabilities, okay. Then Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither 
before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. I'm not a good talker. I, I, I can't just stand before Pharaoh. But Moses said, oh, my Lord, please sin by the hand of whomever else you may sin. Okay. Then Moses gave an excuse. He's not eloquent. He says, anybody would be better than me is about what that last phrase sounds like. Just pick anybody. Anybody's better than me. Let anybody else go. But I'm just not. I'm not the right guy. You, you got the wrong guy. Okay. Verse 14. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, it is not, it, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. Look, there he is. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. The Lord became angry at Moses. God had handpicked Moses and had hand prepared Moses in every way. Moses was effectively accusing God of making a mistake or being insufficient for the task. Moses was locked in fearful reluctance. We can get the same way. When we get our calling from God, we say, oh, Lord, I can't do that. I'm not able to, I'm not going to do that because I just can't do it. I'm not, the, you know, I'm, you're making a big mistake. Verse 15, God commanded Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God, that see, Lord is in all caps, Yahweh. God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. That's God making that statement. See, my is in capital letters. God says, this is my name and my memorial. This is what I'm saying to them. Through you. Powerful words. Scary words to deny to God. Okay, verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I put in your hand. Okay, so, the, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. In other words, he says, you're going to be able to, he gave him a whole series of things to say to Pharaoh. And then he gave him uh, some miraculous things like turning a, a, his, his staff into a snake and then this, grabbing the snake and turning it back into a staff and, and some other things, several other things. But he says that's, a, that's he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Now, the Pharaoh that he's about to go talk to is Amenhotep II. Okay, in, in the appendix, you'll be able to see the Amenhotep II, and he's going to allow the Israelites to leave Egypt. He's not going to allow them to leave, not even under great duress. Okay, and this was a statement to prepare Moses for the difficult time to follow and convincing Pharaoh. Okay, the real contest would not be between Moses nor the Hebrew people against Pharaoh and the Egyptian people. But instead, it's going to be between the Lord and the gods of Egypt. These Egyptian gods were demonic, and did not really exist at all. And even some of the Israelites at that time probably believed in them. <clears throat> the Israelites needed to know that the Lord was infinitely superior to all others, including the demonic. We know this in the New Testament as well. In Ephesians 6, 12, it tell, we are told, we are told, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That means the demonic. We struggle against the demonic. 1 John 4, 4. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, the demonic, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. See, the he who is in you is a capital H, because that's God. 
Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Who can be against us? God is able to do all things. In verse 22, God said to Moses, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, when he says he's not going to let you go, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. That ought to get a grip on him, but he's still not going to believe it. And he's going to he's going to make Moses and he's going to make God show him. Verse 28. So Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. Verse 30, and Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then Moses did the signs in the sight of the people. Verse 31, so the people believed when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction when they bowed their heads and worshiped. Praise the Lord, they believed. God's faithfulness warrants our faith in his provision and his deliverance. He is worthy of our worship every day. In John 20, 29, Jesus said, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. That's you and me, right? Praise the Lord. The greatest blessing comes when God's people are able to simply trust him at his word. Let's pray. Father, we praise your holy name. We, we thank you for these words. And Lord, we realize that what's important for each one of us is, is to repent of our sins to you and to place our faith in in you, Lord Jesus, as our Lord and Savior. With our faith in you, Lord Jesus, everything else will fall in place. As we trust in you, all things are possible. We are able to do all things that you command us to do as we walk with you. Lord, guide us in our lives as we go forward from here. Allow us to live for you. Show us the ways that you would have us to go. And we, we will give you, Lord Jesus, all glory forever and ever. And it's in your great name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. It's good to see you guys. I want to show you these uh, this appendix, which I've been promising you during the whole. These are the names of the pharaohs of the 18th dynasty and the years in, in which they live. Okay. And, um, this last one is Amenhotep II, who is the Pharaoh at the time of the Exodus. And this is the last one we just spoke of. Uh, Thutmose III is the one that had passed away that allowed Moses to go back, leave Midian and go back to uh, speak to Amenhotep II. Okay. Amos I is the one who, who actually established the 18th dynasty. Okay. And that his is the family name that sounds like, is the sound alike for Moses. Okay. This is Hatshepsut, who actually was the Pharaoh for uh, 1498 to 1480, 1498 to 1483. So see, that's, that's only, that's only 19 years. Okay. So she, she, Actually, she passed away is, is the reason why Thutmose the third became came in. But Thutmose the third was just a, a baby when she when Thutmose the second died. 
she took over as queen, as the co queen co-regent, and she became Pharaoh until Thutmose the third got old enough to serve as as Pharaoh. Okay. But uh, I thought you might like to have that. And uh, I'll give you some more information. Keep Hang with me for just a second. You can call us back up or, and you can pause and write all this down if you want to. Moses was born in 1525 or 1524 B.C. under Thutmose I. Hatshepsut, Hatshepsut was daughter of Thutmose I and wife of Thutmose II. She assumed the throne after his death until Thutmose III was old enough to reign. Hatshepsut was likely the princess who would adopt and name Moses, raising him and training him in the palace of Pharaoh. Okay. All the dating that I got for the Pharaohs, I got from this document. Okay, so I need to give credit to my sources. Okay. Uh, they're, they're, the names of the pharaohs, the dates, all of that are from this document. Okay, so I want to give you guys credit, give them credit for that information. All right. And I've got a lot of really cool paintings and sculpture pictures and architecture pictures of ancient Egypt that has those guys, those various uh, pharaohs names on too. So I'll, I'll let you go now. Uh, so this just doesn't get too long, but you can come back and look at this video if you want to pick up more of that information out of the appendix. So I'll see you later next week. Same time, same place. Bye-bye.